if you'd take the Word of God with me and open it in the New Testament to the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 5. 1 Peter, chapter 5, and we'll read one verse together to begin with and then walk through a few verses in this passage in just a moment. The more I grow to love the Lord, the more I hate the devil. And the longer I live and the more I see of Satan's destructive work, the more I'm looking forward to the day that the Lord is going to shut him up forever. By the way, when you read the revelation of Jesus Christ, that's exactly what you find. Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 10, the Bible says that the accuser of the brethren who accused them day and night to God was cast into a pit and shut up forever. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? But I have to tell you, as long as we're in this flesh and as long as we're in this world, we have to deal with the devil. And I'm speaking tonight on dealing with the devil. How do you deal with him? He's real. It's an interesting thing to me that people want to believe that there's a real God, but they don't want to believe there's a real devil. Well, I want you to know the devil is not all-powerful. He is not all-knowing, and he is not all-present like our God is. Hallelujah for that. But he is real. And dealing with him is a reality. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I want you to read the verse out loud with me, would you please? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8. Ready? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. It's a fascinating verse, isn't it? You have to wonder at times all that was going through the mind of these human penmen when they were writing these words under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Who was writing 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8? Simon Peter was. And when he wrote these words, be sober, be vigilant, I wonder if in his mind... He was back suddenly in the garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus was speaking to him. Peter, watch and pray. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then he writes under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And I wonder if Peter, in his memory, was now back standing in Galilee and Jesus said to him, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for thee. You see, I personally believe that when Peter wrote 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8, he had a frame of reference. In other words, he had lived what he was writing about. He was dealing with the devil and he'd had to deal with him for a long time. And now he's writing not in some morbid, depressing kind of way to say, oh, your adversary, the devil, I don't know what we're going to do, wringing his hands and unbelief. No, no, no. He writes in victory. He writes with power. And he says, I want you to know that we're in a battle and the adversary's real and he's after you. But God has made a way that you do not have to be devoured. For centuries, people have tried to imagine things about the devil. By the way, most of what people imagine and, and fantasize about is not real at all. As a matter of fact, it's the furthest thing from the truth. C.S. Lewis, a generation ago, wrote a famous book at the time called The Screw Tape Letters. And in it, he tried to get in the mind of the devil and his demons and talk about how they would attack human beings. Randy Alcorn, a more contemporary author, wrote a very similar book a few years ago called Lord Falgren's Letters. And the idea, it was fiction, of course, but the idea was to reveal something of the truth about what the devil does by imagining what his demons are busy doing. May I say this to you tonight? There is nothing that has ever been written outside the Word of God that can accurately depict what the devil is up to at this moment. 
And there may be a place for fiction at certain, at certain junctures and with certain topics, but I want you to know, if you're going to deal with the devil, you better deal with the truth. And nobody knows the devil like God knows the devil. Matter of fact, Martin Luther said, remember this, even the devil is God's devil. He meant by that that God is the one who created that angel initially and God is the one who cast him out of heaven and God is the one who keeps him in check and God is the one who will put him down forever someday and if you're going to deal with the devil, don't try to get to know the devil better, get to know God better. Because in so doing, you not only understand more about the devil, but you have the spiritual power of God Almighty to deal with it. It's powerful. I ran across something that's quite old the other day. I read through it and I just, I laughed to myself. How many of you know who Paul Harvey was? Good day, right? And now for the rest of the story. Famous radio commentator. I always enjoyed listening to him. One afternoon on his radio program, he began this way. If I were the devil, I mean, if I were the prince of darkness, I would, of course, want to engulf the whole earth in darkness. I would have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I would not be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree. So I should set about however necessary to take over the United States. I would begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, do as you please. To the young, I would whisper, the Bible's a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what is bad is good and what is good is square. In the ears of the young marrieds, I would whisper that work is debasing, that cocktail parties are good for you. I would caution them not to be extreme in religion, in patriotism, in moral conduct. And the old... The old I would teach to pray. I would teach them to say after me, Our Father, which art in Washington. If I were the devil, I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. And then, if I were the devil, I'd get organized. I'd infiltrate unions and urge more loafing and less work because idle hands usually work for me. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. And I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects but neglect to discipline emotions. Let those run wild. I would designate an atheist to front for me before the highest courts in the land. And I'd get preachers to say, that's right. With flattery and promises of power, I could get the courts to rule that I could construe as against God and in favor of pornography. And thus, I would evict God from the courthouse and then from the schoolhouse and then from the houses of Congress. And then in his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion. And I would deify science because that way, men would become smart enough to create super weapons but not wise enough to control them. If I were Satan, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I would take from those who have and I would give to those who wanted until I'd killed the incentive of the ambitious and then my police state would force everybody back to work. Then I could separate families, putting children in uniform, women in coal mines and objectors in slave camps. In other words, if I were Satan, I'd just keep on doing what he's doing. The date, the date that Paul Harvey said those words was April the 3rd, 1965. Fascinating, isn't it, how some things just seem to never change? As a matter of fact, the devil's been up to the same old trick since the Garden of Eden. And I want to say to you tonight that the serpent is the lion. That beautiful serpent that slithered up next to Eve and brought the first temptation into the human race, that old serpent is the roaring lion of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8. Look at the verse for just a moment. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, he's your enemy. By the way, the name that is used here for the devil literally means he's the slanderer. Could I remind you that the devil is a liar and the father of it? Can't speak the truth. He doesn't know the truth. And he wants to convince everybody else of his lies. 
your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. Why would God use this metaphor? Why this object lesson of a roaring lion? You know, lions are carnivores. They're literally flesh eaters. Could I say to you tonight that the thing the devil feeds on most is the flesh? Years ago, Pastor brought a powerful message, actually a series of messages, some of you remember it, on the devil and his friends. If you weren't here, you got to get them. You need to listen to them. Because in that series of message, he connected the devil and the flesh and the world exactly the way God connects it in the pages of Holy Scripture. See, the devil has an inside man. It's called your sin nature. As a matter of fact, your flesh and the devil would get along very nicely because neither one of them want to do the will of God. You remember when Jesus said to his disciples, the prince of this world cometh and he hath nothing in me. In other words, there was nothing in the Lord Jesus that Satan could appeal to. There is no sin nature there. There was none of this world system inside our Lord. But I have to tell you, he's the only one who could ever say that. Because you and I are still in sinful flesh. And you and I are still surrounded by a wicked world. And our adversary, the devil, this roaring lion, knows exactly how to appeal to our flesh. And what's his goal? This lion's no pet. Look at the verse. The Bible says, he walketh about always looking, always seeking, always working. By the way, he has no home. His home is hell. And at this season, he's pondering and he's, he's searching and he's looking. Might I say he's walking in circles. Round and round the human beings. And he's looking for that member of the flock that he can devour. The word devour literally means to disappear. Don't raise your hand. But I wonder how many people in this meeting could think of someone right now that used to sit near you in this church who just disappeared. Or some Christian family that used to always mark and watch and say, oh, what a beautiful family and God's blessing is on them. But now suddenly they've disappeared. I tell you, friends, that's the devil's work. And by the way, would you look at me, please? There's not a single one of us that is above that. You can dress up good and sing the hymns and carry the right Bible and say amen and be devoured of the adversary. As a matter of fact, there's nothing the devil would like any more than to get in a church like this. There's nothing the devil would enjoy any more than getting in families like the families I'm preaching to at this hour. See, the devil knows that he can just get a toehold, just, just a foot in the door, that we've given place to the devil. And now he can do anything he desires to do. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You see, the truth is, he's after the whole flock. We only read verse 8, but let me show you something interesting. If you start in verse number 1 and you read down through verse number 4, he deals with the elders. Literally, he deals with the preacher. May I pause for just a moment and say, I thank God for the pastor God has given to this church. By the way, the pastor is a gift from God. Read Ephesians chapter 4. God gifts the church with pastors like the pastor we have who feed the flock of God, who take the oversight thereof, who don't do it for money, they do it for Jesus. And every time you think of your pastor, you ought to pray for him. Because I tell you, the roaring lion would love to devour him. But wait a minute. We get this crazy notion that the only person the devil's after is the preacher. Boy, if he could get the preacher, he'd really get a prize. Yes? But I tell you, if he can't get the elders, he'll go after the rest of the flock. If he can't devour the shepherd, he'll go after some little lamb like your son or daughter. Some wayward sheep like some precious soul in this church who's, who's wandered off the path 
just a little. Because his goal is to do everything he can to devour the flock, not because we're that important, but because we are that important to God. And the devil knows. He knows if he can devour us, he can hurt the heart of the good shepherd, the chief shepherd that gave himself for us. He can strike at the loving heart of a God who loved me so much, he gave his son for me. That's the strategy of the devil. And you know what's ironic? That we sit in church our whole lives and we think, oh yeah, I know about the devil, but we really don't. No, we're ignorant. If we weren't ignorant, we wouldn't keep falling to his same wiles all the time. I'll hold your place here for a moment. Go back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me show you a fascinating verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 11. And Paul writes, and he says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. There's that military idea again. Don't let him get the upper hand. Don't let him get the high ground. Don't let him get the advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. I tell you that the first part of the verse and the last part of the verse are intimately connected. Look, if you don't want the devil to get the advantage in your home, then don't be ignorant of his devices in your home. By the way, in its context, look at the previous verse, verse number 10. What's he speaking about? Forgiveness. That's interesting. You know where the devil is most likely to get his foot in the door? In the daily details of your relationships. In the mundane of life. In the interactions that we have with one another. And you know what he's always looking for? He's looking for some little way to sneak in where he ought not be. So, what are his devices? What are his wiles? Well, go back with me to 1 Peter chapter 5 for a moment. Let's just walk through a few verses here together. Because I believe that God, in the same chapter that he warns us about the roaring lion, actually gives us not on the negative, but on the positive, how to deal with it. See, if we just obey God, we don't have to worry about the devil. Look, please, friends. You do what God says do, and God will take care of the devil. So what does God say do? Well, look at verse number five. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Would you write the first one down? Maybe in the margin of your Bible, write it down somewhere. Number one, if you're going to deal with the devil, number one, you have to deal with disruptions. You know what one of his great devices is? He loves to disrupt unity. He loves to come between. Let me tell you what the devil likes to do. The devil likes to get between a husband and a wife. Nobody ought to be between a husband and a wife. No, they ought to be one in Christ. But the devil likes to get his foot in the door. The devil likes to get between parents and children. The devil likes to get between pastors and people. Sorry, but the devil likes to get between you and the person seated down the pew from you right now. You know why? Because every time the devil can create disruption among the people of God, look please, it stops the blessing. It holds back all of the good that God desires to do through a people who are of one mind and one accord and one spirit in unity of the Holy Ghost. The devil knows, look, he's intelligent. He knows if he can disrupt that, then he can disrupt every other thing God is desiring to do. So how does he bring disruption? Through pride. By the way, if you're proud of your humility, you're not humble. It's like the guy who wrote the book on the world's 10 most humble men and how I trained the other nine. Something was missing in all of that, you know? No, no. See, we get real pious and we say, oh yeah, I'm humble. Well, let me just tell you, every time you nurse a wound, every time you harbor a bitter thought towards a brother or sister in Christ, every time you get angry because your name should have been called but wasn't, you're giving the devil a place. 
So God says, I know the roaring lion wants to get you. So look, humble yourself. Submit yourself. For years, I heard this passage preached that it was, it was to young people because it begins this way, likewise ye younger. So boy, we wear the young people out. Well, then he says this, look at verse number five, all of you, yea, all of you. This is for everybody. This is for all of God's children. Can I tell you why it begins with the younger? Because that's where we should begin to learn it. Do you know where you should begin to learn submission? As a young man or a young lady. As a child, as a teenager. But all the young people look at me for just a moment. Nobody likes somebody to tell them what to do. But it's a way of life. People say, when I graduate from high school, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Friend, you're in for a rude awakening in life. Mm -mm. All of your life, there's going to be someone for you to submit to. And the best life you could possibly have will be the life that learns humility and submission when you are young. Because all of life, it will keep you from the snares of the devil. And let's just be honest, we're all proud. We preach about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the what? Pride of life. You ever wonder why it says pride of what? Life. Because if you're living, you've got it. In all of life, no matter what age you are, what stage you are, you don't outgrow pride. No, there's ego, there's self-interest, there's selfishness in every one of us, and it has to die every day. And it's interesting, look at the verse. The Bible says, be clothed with humility. I always read this with the idea it's some beautiful garment. It's some, it's some beautiful thing that we put on and it's a mark of real maturity. Do you know this word clothed is the same word that Jesus used when he girded himself with a towel to serve his own disciples? Interestingly enough, who was it he had a conversation with while he's washing their feet? Peter. Peter said, I don't understand this. And the Lord says, you don't understand this now, but you will understand it hereafter. 1 Peter 5. I think Peter got it. I think Peter is thinking back now, and he's seeing the master down on his knees with a towel girded about him, washing the dirty feet of his own followers, even Judas' feet. Then he says, if we're not going to fall to the roaring lion's devices, then number one, we're going to have to humble ourselves and submit ourselves and beware of disruptions. May I give you a second one? Look at verse number seven. Boy, here's a famous verse. This one gets quoted a lot. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And we lift that verse out and we quote it by itself, but the truth of the matter is it's connected to a lot of things. Would you write this one down, number two? If you're going to deal with the devil, not only do you have to deal with disruption, secondly, you have to learn to deal with discouragements. Because as long as you live, you're going to have problems. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Let's take a survey. This is not scientific, but it'll prove the point, all right? How many of you have had any problem in the last week? Would you raise your hand, please? Yes, good. How many of you had any problem in the last 24 hours? Would you raise your hand, please? Sure. You look, expect it. He said, boy, you're really encouraging. Yes, expect it. Tomorrow you're going to get up and something's not going to go right. Expect it. Now watch, please. Here's what the devil will do. You say, yeah, the devil brings all those. Not necessarily. But I'll tell you what he will do. When they come, he'll get in your ear about them. You remember I said to you a moment ago, the word devil here means slanderer? And immediately we say, oh, he's the accuser of the brethren. That's right. He stands in the presence of God and he accuses us to God. Turn it around. He does the other too. He accuses God to us. The devil will get in your ear and he'll say something to you like this. Here, you went to church all day yesterday and look how the Lord rewards you today. You've been paying the tithe faithfully and look at your car broken down. I thought God was going to honor your faithfulness. See, the devil likes to whisper. He's quite a whisperer. 
the roaring lion makes lots of noise. He really likes to whisper. And he likes to, to use a, an athletic metaphor, he likes to pile on. He, he likes to kick a man when he's down. So what are you going to do about it? How are you going to deal with discouragements when they come? Well, look at the verse. The Bible says you're going to learn to cast all your care upon him. Now, this is really deep theology. You ready? But here's what the word cast means. You ready? Would you look here, please? Here's cast. Don't miss it. Here's cast. It's exactly what the word means. Look at it, please. Literally, I just, I can't carry these by myself, Lord. I, I can't handle this anymore, Lord. I just roll it on you. Next time you get really frustrated and just go, remember, look, this. Casting all your care upon him. Psalm 55 says the same thing. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain thee. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. You know the problem? The problem is we're carrying around burdens and cares God never intended us to carry. And when you see Christian people who have the same frowns and deep furrows on their brow and seem down all the time and never a good word to say, those are people that are in the snare of the devil because they've never learned how to cast their care on the Lord. By the way, do you know where that care comes from? The previous verse, pride. You know why I like to carry my own burdens? Look, you know why I like to load myself up with all my own burdens and cares and carry them around everywhere? Because I like to tell everybody what a hard time I'm having. That's right. And I'm proud I'm carrying them. I'm just going to tell you, that's going to make you miserable and it's going to make everybody else around you miserable. Years ago when I first started traveling for the college, pastor had taught me, he taught me so many things. One of the things he taught me was how to travel light. He said to me, you don't need a lot of luggage. He said, you can live for two or three days with just one little bag. You'll be fine. You know what I've learned through the years walking through airports with one little bag? There's a whole lot of people trying to carry way too much luggage on airplanes. You ever watch somebody carrying four or five bags? They've paid extra for them too, you know. They're weighted down with them and they're frustrated and unhappy. Look, you'll enjoy the journey much better if you'll travel light. You know what happens to us? We start picking up the luggage of life and we carry it all of our life. There are people listening to me right now that have bitterness in their heart they've carried for 20 years. There are people listening to me at this moment that have griefs and burdens and guilt over something that you confessed 10 years ago and said God forgave you of, but you can't sleep at night thinking about it. I'm just going to tell you, you're carrying around something right now that God never intended you to carry on your own. Say, so what am I going to do about it? You're going to cast all your care upon him for he careth for you. F.B. Meyer said there are only two things that come between man and God, sin and cares. And you deal with your cares the same way you dealt with your sin. You give them to Jesus. Amen. Hey, when you got saved, what did you do with your sin? You just gave it to Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you, the same one who bears the sins bears the cares. Bring your cares to Jesus and say, I'm not going to live under this weight and load of worldly care and anxious fretting anymore. I'm not going to give any place to the devil in my life. I give that to you, Jesus. If you're going to deal with the devil, you're going to have to deal with disruptions. If you're going to deal with the devil, you're going to have to deal with discouragements. But there's a third one. Look down to verse number nine. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Would you write down a third one? If you're going to deal with the devil, you're going to have to learn to deal with distractions. You know what I've learned to come to believe, I believe that one of Satan's primary tools is distraction. Not getting you off in some terrible sin, but getting your eyes on things that really don't matter. Moving so quickly through life that everything's a blur. And instead of your eyes fixed on Jesus, that's where the peace is, by the way, friend. Instead of your eyes stayed on Christ, suddenly you're looking at temptations and you're looking at persecutions. You're looking in the word that is used here in verse number nine, at afflictions. Mark the last three words, in the world. Sounds a lot like 1 Corinthians chapter 10, doesn't it? There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Friend, if you're in the world, you're going to deal with the same temptations and the same persecutions. 
and the same afflictions. And I'm going to tell you what the devil wants. The devil is trying to get your eyes off of Jesus. Can I just say, say this to you? You can't live an unholy life with your eyes on Jesus. You can't nurse an impure thought with your eyes on Jesus. You can't say an angry word with your eyes on Jesus. Because when you put your eyes on Jesus, something changes on the inside. You see, we're not ignorant of his devices, or maybe we are. But they've been around for a long time. Hey, Eve. Did God actually say that? Disruption. No, what God's doing is God's keeping good things from you. He knows if you ever eat this fruit, you'll have knowledge you've never had before. Isn't it terrible that God's keeping all of that from you? Discouragement. Hey, Eve. Look at this fruit. It's, it's beautiful to the eyes. It's a tree to be desired to make one wise. It's good for food. Distraction. And through every one of this roaring lion's devices, look please, he's drawing the heart of God's people away from the only one who's worthy of having our heart and attention. Now, I didn't give this message tonight so we could all leave saying, well, woe is me. I, I've really blown it. And the devil, he's, he's so powerful and he's so smart. And look, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let's end in an Old Testament passage. I want you to go back with me to Zechariah chapter 3 for just a moment. This is a book we don't typically go to very often, but I promise you it's in the Bible. It's near the end if that helps. Zechariah chapter number three. I came to this passage. Oh, the Spirit of the Lord helped me here. He helped me here. May the Lord help you here. Look at Zechariah chapter three and verse number one. Zechariah has a vision. God gives it to him. The Bible says in verse one, and he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Look, here is the high priest of Israel standing before the Lord Jesus. And guess who else is there? Can I tell you that at your highest, holiest moments, the devil's also working. You ever wonder why when you're praying, sometimes you have the most terrible thoughts? You ever wonder why when you're trying to do the right thing, it seems like there's such adversity against you? Because there is. Everything God ordains, Satan opposes. There is a spiritual conflict going on. But I like verse 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, Boy, I'm glad God speaks. The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Watch this. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? You read the rest of the chapter and you realize Joshua's clothes are dirty. He's defiled and he's standing in the presence of a holy God. And the accuser of the brethren is standing there pointing his finger and saying, look at him. He doesn't deserve to be in here. Look at him. And the Lord says, that's enough. What you're looking at, Satan, is a brand plucked out of the fire. Look at Scott Pauley. He's a sinner. Look at, his, look at his thoughts and look at his actions and look at his reactions and look at his words. He didn't deserve heaven. He didn't deserve to live in the presence of God. He didn't deserve to be able to pray. And God said, wait a minute. That's enough. The Lord rebuke thee, Satan. Because what you're looking at is a brand that has been plucked out of the fire. Look, friend, all you and I deserve is to burn in hell forever. But God in his mercy plucked us out of the fire. I'm not there tonight. I'm never going there. The devil is going there forever. And as surely as there is an accuser and a prosecutor, hallelujah, I know the judge. And I know the defense attorney. 
And whatever you might think about the devil's doings in this world and in your life, I tell you tonight, God is greater. Would you go back with me to 1 Peter chapter 5 and we'll finish because we stopped short in our reading. How do you deal with the devil? Only one way, by depending on the Lord. We read verse 8, we read verse 9. But would you look please at verses 10 and 11. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory, by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.